Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. Thanks for joining in. Today we have a special guest. We have the NEPSAC AAA School Northfield Mount Hermans head coach, John Carroll, joining us today. John, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Of course. Thanks for the invite. Appreciate it, Corey. I just want to give you a, a thanks because it was last summer when uh, we were eating lunch in Denver, Colorado, that you and I were talking about this actual podcast, and you were really supportive of it. Um, you were saying that there's a need out there. I should do it. And here we are in February of 2021, and it's actually a reality. So without your guidance on this, we would not be talking today. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome. It made sense. <laughs> um, I think well, you, uh, you're, you're, the, you're an interesting guy, thoughtful guy, and I thought you had, a, you had a good voice for a podcast. Yeah, maybe not the face, but the voice uh, <laughs> can make work. Yeah. Tell me this. Um, we discussed this last summer. We'll just, we'll just kick off with this question. Like, there is a need for a prep school podcast. What, what's one thing you think the, the general public, the general basketball public needs to know about the prep school world that maybe they don't know right now? I think the, uh, there's a lot, but I think what you can provide specifically is facts. Um, I think if people listen, it's great preparation for college. I think there's so many similarities and we call it, you know, we, we call it practice. Like we are, when you're picking your prep school, it really is practice for the, for the selection of a college. And if you do this process right, you're probably going to do the college process right. And what we mean by right is uh, chasing the facts. And um, there's just not enough reliable sources that are third party that are factual resources for families. So a family can talk to me, get my facts. A family can talk to another prep school, get their facts. But that's directly from us. And I think the more resources families have to find third-party factual statements and factual information and, and unbiased opinions um, that are you know, educated, and it, it's only going to help. So I think, um, you know, in your case, you've been to so many, you visited so many schools, uh, you've talked to so many of us, uh, you're a great resource for families um, because you're coming from a place that's factual based. And I think there's so many people who have opinions about prep schools that don't understand and appreciate the range of prep schools that exist. So anything that could be out there to help families figure out this process, the better. Um, you know, I went to prep school and I, and I say it all the time, I got really lucky finding Northfield Mount Hermon. And I don't want kids to get lucky. Um, I want kids to find places that make sense because of the facts and the evidence that, that's there. So I think what you're doing is great. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And what, what makes you and I a little bit different than this too, is we both did post-grad years. So we can actually that's speak right. on it, tell about our experience and say the pros and cons to families. Uh, versus someone maybe that's pitching it that doesn't know what it's like on a February when it's cold out and you got to get up early and go to class and you know you're away from home for the first time. So I think that's invaluable, whether it's from me or from a prep school coach. So I, uh, I had a bad a bad connection there. The last the last sentence. What did you say at the end? Sorry. I said you're the greatest program to ever exist in the prep school. <laughs> That's what I thought you said. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get to the background on how you ended up to uh, where you're at today. Tell me your background on where you're from, um, your playing career, and, and, and why you picked basketball maybe over another sport. Yeah, I, was, uh, I grew up in Rockaway Beach, New York, uh, southernmost tip of New York State, uh, technically Queens, um, but has a little bit more personality like Brooklyn. Geographically, it's an extension of Long Island. Um, basketball was really the sport. Like we, we hung out on the beach. Uh, it was, it's a, it was really an interesting place to grow up because you're, you're, you're on a beach in New York city. So like, you know, at night you have the skyline behind you and you have darkness of the Atlantic ocean and clear skies, uh, stars at night. So it was a unique place, but, um, uh, the history of, of the, of the place was basketball. So we played basketball, hung out at the beach, 
Um, and then we went and played more basketball. Uh, the McGuire brothers, Alan Dick and, and Brian Winters, uh, just, you know, long, long, long history of great basketball. So um, I wasn't very good when I was younger, fifth, sixth grade. I was, you know, playing on a really, really good CYO team. Uh, our team was winning the New York State Diocesan Championships. Uh, Kenny Anderson was at Our Lady of Angels, and it always came down to us and them in the finals. And I was, a, you know, a decent player. I was probably, you know, eighth and ninth man. Um, basketball was probably my third best sport. I was a swimmer growing up. Um, I was I was winning, you know, all the sprint championships in, in, in diocesan, uh, Brooklyn, Queens. <clears throat> uh, baseball was probably number two. I was a catcher and then basketball. Um, but I loved basketball. So the sound of the ball going through the net still impacts me at 50 years old. Um, so as I got older, I just kept, I just kept, the, the, you know, St. Francis de Sales was our CYO and, and um, it was the, the, the park was right down the block from my house. And any free time, I would just go there and, you know, it was, it was my time with me and my basketball and playing outside. And I would shoot nonstop. And um, uh, I got better as a seventh grader, got better as an eighth grader, still not really uh, a starter. Um, you know, had really good teams. John Dunn was a teammate of mine. He was one of the, you know, the better players in New York City at the time, fifth grade through eighth grade. He's now the head coach at Marist. Um, and then uh, fast forward, I, was, I went to Poly Prep. I was there from seventh grade through 12th grade. Um, my 10th grade year was really the, the change for me. Um, I went from being, you know, a five, nine, you know, uh, soft kid a little bit, and then came back six, two had acne, greasy hair, you know, grew five inches in the summer. And then, you know, everything started to click with basketball. Um, I averaged, you know, I think it was like 25 points a game as a sophomore in JV really gained a lot of confidence. Um, and then just kept shooting, kept shooting, kept shooting. By this time, swimming went went by the wayside. Um, uh, football became pretty big. I was a linebacker and a tight end on the football team. Poly Prep had really great history of football. I was getting recruited for some football. Um, I remember meeting with a college coach my junior year, and they were like, I have three questions for you. Do you love the weight room? Do you love the weight room? Do you love the weight room? And I was like, not so much. I like to shoot. And my bass, my football was over. Um, uh, became a pitcher on the baseball team. Um, but my junior year, I was 17 points a game at Poly. And then the three-point line came uh, my senior year. And that changed everything. So I went from averaging 17 points a game to 29 points a game. And um, I, the math made sense to me. You know, three points over two points. Uh, just seemed to make sense. So uh, became really an aggressive three-point shooter. Um, I saw the advantage of spreading the floor. Uh, my brother was our point guard, and he, he, he was able to create opportunities off the bounce. He was able to draw and kick, um, and basketball really became it. Um, after my senior year, played at St. Francis de Sales uh, Summer League, and that was really an instrumental uh, season for me. Uh, won MVP of the league. Uh, Brian Nash, who's a director of basketball at IMG, he and I were teammates. Terrence Mullen was, you know, also played in our team, um, and it was great. And you know, just gave me more confidence. And then I went on to North Vermont Herman for a post grad year. Um, it wasn't the school I was originally going to go to, um, but I was. My parents were fortunate, you know, lucky enough to allow me to you know, explore some schools after I made a commitment to a school in New Jersey. Um, and then decided to come to NMH and it was the right place. You know, again, scored a lot of points, 29, 27 points a game. And I chose to go to Assumption College. Um, and then again, they let me shoot almost whenever I was open. So uh, shot 800 threes there, made 342 of them and scored 1,500 points. We won our, our league championship a couple of years. Division two basketball was awesome. Um, and then eventually made it back here after a stint on Wall Street working for Morgan Stanley and came back to NMH in 2001 okay so that's 20 years now you're coming up on yeah this is the i'm finishing 20 all right one thing i want to touch base on is a lot of your kids you coach now and that you recruit are specialized just in basketball and you talk about playing four sports growing up 
do you think that helps you? And if so, how so? I, I mean, I think it's not for everybody, but I think it helped me as a, as a younger kid. Uh, swimming just makes you so much stronger than everybody else. You know, like other kids aren't lifting when they're eight, nine, 10 years old. And as a swimmer, you get, you know, core strength, back strength, shoulder strength. And there was a real advantage to that. Um, competing against kids who are my age, I just felt stronger and I could take a hit more than they could. So I think in that sense, um, it added a dimension that I wouldn't have had if I was just a basketball player. Um, football was good, you know, you have a lot of contact, but you know, anybody who plays football is gonna get hurt. And I, you know, I did, I had a knee injury um, and then baseball was great. But, you know, for me, it was really, uh, anytime you can get a kid to compete, um, it's important. And I don't care what they're competing in. And being able to play a sport like swimming where you're down to the hundreds of the second in a, in a 50 yard sprint, um, playing football where you're having explosive two to four second interactions and exchanges on, uh, athletically, and then baseball, where you're, you know, got to know the scout. You got to know what this guy likes to hit. Uh, you got to know the counts, who's on first, who's on third. You know, there's a lot of gamesmanship that happens and a lot of strategy. So I think it does help to play multiple sports. But I think it, at some point, you really got to start to specialize. And, you know, for me, that's really freshman, sophomore year. Um, there has to be a specialization. But I think as a younger kid, play everything. Right. Now let's get back to North Vermont Hermits. You've been there 20 years now and you've got a, a great track record. For people that don't, don't know about your school, why don't you give an elevator pitch on the basketball program, the school, the location, everything NMH provides to a potential student there? Yeah, I mean, is, is, uh, in terms of basketball, we're the best academic and basketball school in the country. Uh, we've sent 43 players to the Ivy League in the last 12 years. We've been ranked in the top five for 12 consecutive seasons. We've played in 10 straight national championship tournaments. We've been to seven final fours. We've won four New England titles. So I think we're very unique in the situation that, um, you know, we're amongst the best academic schools in the country and also amongst the best basketball schools in the country. Uh, as far as a school goes, we're one of the larger schools in the country. We have 660 kids. They come from 53 countries. Um, it really is as close to college as you can get without actually being in college. Uh, our campus is 1,200 acres. Um, to put that in perspective, it's you know same size as Virginia Tech, and Virginia Tech has 60,000 kids at it. Um, so they get you know a much more of a you know this, this is uh, it's more than high school. Um, you know there are a lot of great prep schools out there, 200, 300 kids. Um, you know, having 660, 50 countries, almost every state, um, and then having the hybrid of basketball and academics landing in one spot. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not for everybody, but for the kids that it is for, um, you know, it's a home run as far as their experience. I mean, uh, for me, I went, went to Poly Prep in Brooklyn and it was a great academic, great social experience, but I had to sacrifice the basketball um, while I was there. And what we really try to pride ourselves is there's no sacrifice. Um, and the great part about the school is uh, our kids are not big guys on campus. They're not the big men on campus other than their height. Um, you know, we have a $35 million art center. We're building a $40 million STEM building. Um, this is high, high level kids achieving at extremely high level. Laura Linney, you know, Golden Globes, Academy Awards, Uma Thurman, you know, we can go on and on, drop in all kinds of alums names. But it's a, a place where kids achieve. And, um, you know, for me, if you read Angela Duckworth's book, um, kids get gritty when they're amongst a group. And I think kids achieve when they're around other kids that are achieving. Um, so I think that's, you know, animation in a nutshell. But um, yeah, I think it's a really special place where kids can really chase it. Yeah. And, you know, when I first started, you know, exploring, doing prep school consulting, uh, I asked a lot of my college contacts, hey, if I'm going to visit, you know, only three prep schools in New England on this one trip, where should I, where should I check out? Every single one of them mentioned your schools here. Very well respected among the college coaches. But you really do talk about you sending so many kids to Ivy League, right? Um, 
correct me if I'm wrong, you sent more kids to Ivy's than all the other prep schools combined in that same time period. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I don't know what the actual number is, but it was um, uh, it was more than every other NEPSAC combined. And, um, you know, in, this, is, this was true in like 2017. We had more kids in the Ivy League than every state except for Texas and California. So California's got 5,000 high schools. Texas has 3,000. And they're the only two states that beat us. We beat Illinois, we beat New York. So um, that was really the, the, the niche. We have you know 14 kids in the, in the Ivy League next year and every game will have an NMH alum in it. Right. But what do you attribute that to? Like why, why do you have that pipeline there? Is it your combination of academics to where the coaches know every kid here is gonna qualify for it? Or is it there's something you do in training? Like what's, what's your it factor that leads to that? For us, it was really, um, I remember, um, uh, 2006, 2007, we had a really great team. Uh, Tyrone Nash went to Notre Dame. We, uh, Andrew Van Ness went to Harvard. Two kids with LaSalle. Another kid, two kids went to UMass. It was a really, really good team. And um, uh, we lost in the first round of the NEPSAC tournament to Bridgeton, who went on to win it. And I was just like, you know, we just can't compete apples to apples with these other schools. Like there has to be something different. I'm not going to beat Bridgeton if I try to play beat Bridgeton. Um, we're not, you know, there was MCI was still in league. I'm not going to beat MCI if I'm playing like MCI. So really it was um, intentional, very deliberate where we were like, all right, our niche has to be something different. If a kid's in Omaha, Nebraska, and they're a great kid and academically they're very, very successful and they play basketball, where do they go to school? And there wasn't a place at the time, like there was nowhere for that kid who was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go there because that's what they, they do. So I saw that, you know, I thought there was a market available and uh, a niche that we could compete in um, where we can kind of compete on our terms rather than competing on these other, the terms of these other guys who were very well established, you know, you know how are you gonna compete with Jerry Quinn and, and, and Witt uh, on their terms? Um, so I needed to create some terms of our own. And uh, I saw that there was an opportunity to really chase the basketball and the academic combination. And the good part for us is that it fit our school. So I wasn't trying to create something that our school um, wasn't already doing, um, but they weren't doing it specifically in, in athletics, but that's in, in relation to basketball. Gotcha. Now, for those people that don't know your admission standards, like. Do you have to have a, a minimum GPA or SAT or ACT score to even be considered to be at your school yeah, and make I mean, your team? Yeah, I mean, for us, our, our, we like to make our standards a little bit even higher than the admissions office. So um, for me, it's like a 3 3 1200 is the minimum. Um, and then we go from there. Most of our guys, you know, this year's team, I think we have like four or five guys with 34 or higher on the ACT. Um, you know, this, this year's team is really, really, really smart. So um, we try to have higher standards in the admission office. I, I remember talking to Bob McKillop at Davidson and they um, have very high standards as far as admissions. And the goal that he has is he doesn't wanna bring anybody to the risk committee. Um, meaning that, you know, socially, uh, you know, we're taking a chance or academically we're taking a chance or for some reason we're taking a chance on this kid in order to accept them to Davidson. And I really liked that idea and I, and I took it and I was like, well, I'm not gonna have anybody go to our risk committee. So I really wanted our standards to be even higher than what the admission office had. Um, so the admission office, um, you know, I, I worked there for 14 years and I've been six years in athletics. So I don't know what their averages are at this point, but um, for us, we're really looking three, five, 1250 plus 1300. Like that's really the cutoff for us. Um, we use 3-3-1200 three, three, because that's a, if you use the uh, Ivy League academic index, that's about a 186. And that's the lowest you can be in the Ivy League. So for me, uh, that was the standard. I was like, all right, well, you know, worst case scenario, they're qualified for the Ivy League. Um, so that was really our niche, um, is making sure that uh, they would be qualified for that. Gotcha. Um, well, that's good information to let people know. And if they don't even have that level. No need to even reach out to you. There's plenty of other places to look at, but that's your, yeah. your specialty there is for that high academic, high caliber basketball player. So it kind of makes it easier right. for some people. 
Um, let's talk about your team of 24 this year. So I know with COVID, it's been uh, it's been different. I think you planned this even before COVID, but you know, a lot of prep school teams now are looking into a second team, one, because there is so much demand, two, because there's so much supply with the class of 2021. But you've got a unique way of how you've done your, not, I don't even want to call it two teams because you kind of interchange it. Why don't you explain to me and everyone else how your 24 kids works, how you split them up, why you decided to take 24 versus just a standard 12 to 15. And, and, and are you going to move forward with this in the future? Yeah, great question. We, um, uh, for me, like it's all about college prep. So one of the things we say to kids, if you want to be a high school superstar, don't come here. Like I've coached 20 years and we really had one true superstar and it was Chris Ledlum. He was Gatorade player of the year. He scored 939 points in the season for us. Um, but the other guys have been really, really great prep school players that went on to play great college basketball. So um, originally we carried about 18 guys. Uh, this is originally meaning about the last five years. And the reason we did it was because, uh, and again, specifically the Ivy League and the high-end academics, their rosters grew. So their rosters were 18, 19, even 20. And in order for my guys to be prepared for college, I was like, okay, we're going to do that too. So when you get to a place like Princeton or Penn or, you know, Northwestern Stanford, and they have 18 guys on a roster, it's not going to be a shock. Um, and I thought, you know, going to these practices, you would see freshmen overwhelmed by the roster size of these colleges. So initially we grew our roster for that response. Like, all right, colleges have 18, we're going to have 18. Colleges have 19, we're going to have 19. And then we're going to teach you how to prepare for that level arrive. And as a freshman, we want you to start. We want you to play right away and not be overwhelmed by, you know, the number of guys in your roster. So that was the initial plan. And then um, uh, interest started to grow. And we were like, we want to create a second varsity team. Uh, and we call them national and prep. And this is the first year we did it. Uh, because what was happening was the market shifted where, you know, um, uh, Kids wanted to play. They wanted to play in games. So for a long time, we, we would say, if you're, if you're coming to North Lundheim for 270 days, great. If you're coming for 30 days, don't come. You know, we don't want you focusing on just game day. Like there's so much development here that the, the games are only part of it. You know, 270 days of development, 270 days against going against 15 Division One guys every day. Um, so that was really the emphasis. And then the market was like, yeah, but I want to play in games. So I was like, okay, great. We're going to have two varsity teams. Uh, everything will be exactly the same, same program, same workouts, same practice time. We'll just switch. We'll just split them on a game day. So this way there's 12 guys on each team and everybody plays and everybody's happy. Um, and then COVID happened. So what we did this year was um, we did have uh, everyone together. So we do work out, but uh, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, this year we would split them up into four teams and we'd have four teams of six and we would treat it almost like pool play in aau so the red team would play the blue team the white team would play the red team and they would play against each other for two days and then we would tally the wins and whoever won between those teams would advance to the championship round so uh college coaches were watching everything we have key motion so it's an automated video system we just flick the switch and the uh, camera comes on um, and we would practice as that group or as that team on Thursday we would give each team three or four sets that were specific to them and then they would run our offense as a group um, and then Friday Saturday we would have championship rounds and they would play for a trophy so they would represent an, an NMH team from the past that won a title and it would be the 2016 New England champs playing against the 2013 national champs. And it, it grew uh, real interest and, and, and curiosity from our alums and they got involved. And then they would be talking smack about who was going to win the game. And so for Friday and Saturday, we would play a championship round. Saturday, we would have a champion. Uh, on Sunday, we would have a top 10 game, basically an all-star game for the week. And then we would have another game. So the top two players from the other game would join the top 10 game. So you'd have 12 guys in each game. Um, and then we'd split the team up and we would have a scrimmage and we would put them in all alternate jerseys. And um, 
they would really, really compete, and it was great. And it was, it, 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 it was, you know, uh, just throwing some ideas against the wall, and it, they really stuck, and it was awesome. And our guys got into it, so it really was good. Um, but what I learned this year is, is kids have about 11 days of stamina. Uh, you know, previous years you'd be like, okay, here's the preseason; it lasts eight to ten weeks. Here's the season; it lasts you know, three months, here's the postseason that lasts two, three months. And this year, max, you had 11 days before they kind of lost interest. So every Tuesday, we were switching teams um, in order to keep it fresh. Uh, but the guys seemed to love it. Uh, in, re in response to COVID, we also built an outdoor court on campus. Um, we also found these field of dreams of three courts that I didn't even know existed about 15 minutes from our campus, and we were using that outside had these great LED lights. Um, so we really seem to, you know, try and make the most of the COVID situation for sure. Now moving forward, say next year's opened up, we, what will you do then? Yeah, I love the idea of having um, the, the two teams. The gym is electric. Um, the, the enthusiasm, the, the program, everything was better with uh, having two teams. Um, so we'll continue with going forward for sure. Uh, we'll probably going forward. We'll probably use it more of as a, as a feeder team with some younger guys um, sprinkled in with some post grads. Um, but I, I really enjoyed the idea. The guys loved it. Um, you know, I can't imagine anyone on our team would say, "What if we didn't have a second team and we didn't have these other guys?" I think it would be, you know, I don't think they can imagine their lives without these teammates. Um, and the only reason we were able to bring in these teammates was because of a second team. So um, I think we'll have a second team going. Forward. Well, I know we will. We'll have a second team going forward for sure. Well, talk to me about placement this year, because obviously it's tough to place all your last year players in a normal year, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me how it's been going this year for not just your good players, but also the guys uh, that are maybe spots 18 through 24. Yeah, it's been great. We, um, you know, it's, it's um, uh, fortunate in the sense that we've had 20 years of relationship already developed. Um, I can imagine this being really, really hard for um, coaches with less experience and less of a network um, and, you know, really less of a history with, the, with coaches as far as referrals and placement and things like that. Um, but we've been really fortunate with, A, the, the caliber of student. Uh, these are really, truly outstanding students. Um, the recommendations and their applications are spot on. These are elite. And then the basketball, we've been seeing so much thanks to the key motion and the system we've had um, that we've had, you know, just endless amounts of tape. Uh, what we did was we created a, a roster um, that had a hyperlink for each kid. So, you know, Corey Heist would have uh, his own roster, his, his line in our roster, you know, height, weight, all that. And then there was a link that brought you to the Corey page. And on that page, it had transcripts, test scores, height, contact information, social media uh, links. Um, and then every day that we played, we had, we had highlights. So um, if coaches needed, hey, I saw Corey played really, you know, I like the highlights from October 4th. Can you send me the link to that day? Uh, we could. So um, every coach in the country, Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, was getting emails uh, about our guys. Um, so in that case, you know, by November, there were, November 1st, there were 40 days of video for each one of our guys. Um, and I think the advantage we have is uh, we do so much, we take so much care in finding out who the guys are as citizens that coaches don't feel like they have to do their legwork for that because we've done it. And the track record we have, we've had you know over 30 guys who were captains in college over the last 10 years, and um, there's a track record for it. Like you know, North Mount Herman, they take care of of the of the social uh, character leadership piece. So that that hopefully that box is checked. So really, and then they see the transcript, you know, three nine, thirty four ACT. That box is checked. At NMH, all they really have to do is evaluate them as a player. Um, so we just we shifted how we did it. But it really hasn't, in the end, it hasn't changed too much as far as what information is being shared, but how it got shared, 
changed quite a bit. Um, but as far as placement, we got, you know, uh, Columbia Commit, Brown, Penn, University of Chicago, uh, Rochester, Emory, and Caltech. Um, you know, six out of seven are top 10 in the country academically. The other one's top 25. And we have two more guys left, and we feel really good about their placement, too. Uh, one's down to two schools. The other one's got a few options. Um, so we feel pretty good about it. No, oh, that's pretty great. Um, one thing this summer you said to me is we were talking about placement of kids and the phrase go where you're wanted came up and yeah. that's that from from up until that point I, of us having that lunch was a go-to I used with families and you did not agree with that quote can you explain a little bit more about that because I, I can't expect when I, your voice pops in my head and I can't remember the answer but you must share it with your kids all the time. So do you mind elaborating on that, John? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that conversation that you and I had. First of all, I enjoyed the meal. And you got to text me the name of the place. If I ever go back <laughs> to Denver, I'm going back. Well, I'll um, take you again. So just let me know. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, this goes back to my Wall Street days where, you know, I was trained to sell two emotions. One is fear and one is greed, Right. And those are the two emotions that humans respond to most. And with, with my college placement and the guys that we work with, we tell our guys, pay attention to when they're selling that. Don't go there, you're not gonna play. Uh, you go there, you're not gonna have a, a good career. Uh, that coach is such and such. Uh, their roster is really big. Um, or they sell the greed. You come here, you'll be all American. You come here, you'll be a pro. You come here and you do this. So it comes under the umbrella of selling fear and greed. Uh, I could want you as much as I want. And if you go where you're wanted instead of where the facts are, when you arrive on campus, if you don't play well, they don't want you. So that is not a fact-based process for me. That is an emotional-based process. Go where you're wanted. Well, what if that place you're a shooter and what if that place doesn't have anyone shooting over 153s in a season? Uh, what if they don't play freshmen? What if they don't have the, the, the roster uh, aligned with your position? Um, so there's so many facts now instead of just relying on where you're wanted. Uh, wanted is an emotional thing that can just pass in, in a moment. Uh, I've coached kids that were the highest recruited schools ever gotten and uh, didn't play as a freshman. And I've had kids walk on, end up as captains in all league. Uh, whether or not they were wanted had zero impact on their college career. Uh, that is 100% only a recruiting tool. Uh, so I got into an, well, a, a college coach got into an argument with me and, and really confronted me on it. And they said, those are the, the two things that we're selling right now is we want you more and we're working the hardest to get you. Uh, they're doing their job. Tell me how your school can beat Stanford. Head to head, give me the stats, give me the figures, give me all that. Tell me where your guys have played after the career was over. Tell me the network that your school has in relation to another school. Tell me uh, the playing time of freshmen. Tell me how many threes a guy shoot. So there's so many facts now that are available. And this is why I like what this podcast uh, the facts are so available now that you don't have to rely on who's working hardest to get you and who wants you the most. All that means is that you have a really good assistant coach who is hustling. And I respect that 100%, but that's not why you should make a decision to college. Because A, that coach may leave. Uh, and there's just, you know, a lot of reasons not to just rely on want and hard work. Um, that doesn't translate to playing time that doesn't pl translate the style of play that doesn't translate to them having your major the size of the school the location uh whether the league makes sense so there's so many more things that should be ahead of that that um it's great that they want you i hope they want you but that's not that shouldn't be even in the top 10 that shouldn't be in the top 15 for me right so yeah, that's good that's based on facts but if the team on paper that makes more sense fact-wise is just not showing you the love, that's probably a conversation you're going to have to have with that family. 
Yeah, for sure. And let them know this. Okay. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, like, you know, there's no guarantee with minutes. And, uh, you know, families are looking for that type of stuff, you know. Well, I've always heard another creed of if, if a coach guarantees you minutes, you should run away. Because that's, that's right. no one should ever say that. You should, everything should be earned. So Absolutely. Since you've been at Northfield for 20 years, how's, how's the kid and the families that you've had on your team evolved either for the better or for the worse during that time? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we, uh, what we find is that the kids aren't as resilient, right? Um, you know, when, when, when I first got here, kids kind of had to figure out some things on their own. And kids figure out fewer things on their own. So I remember uh, meeting with a freshman that we had here. And I said that, you know, you had 10 opportunities to be resilient this year. How many did your mother take care of? And how many did you take care of? And his question was, what does resiliency mean? <laughs> and I was like, that's so perfect. I can't believe you walked into that. So we explained what it meant to be resilient. And he was like, all right, my mom did nine. I did one. And I think that's the, the parents want to clear the path um, way more than they used to. And um, we create opportunities for there to be resiliency moments, right? Where um, they're going to have to, you know, and I think that's why there's so many kids that are transferring is because when they get to college, they haven't practiced resiliency. They haven't, you know, come to an obstacle they don't know how to overcome it. They don't have the tools in their toolbox. And they're just like, this is really hard. I'm leaving. And um, what I've found is that the parents have, you know, we call it, you know, because we're in New England, we call it Zamboni. Like some people call it helicopter parents. Well, I think it's changed. It's a Zamboni parent where they, they, they smooth out the ice. Um, and then the ice gets rough and then they smooth it out. And I think uh, that's been the biggest change is, um, we've taken away the opportunity for kids to be resilient. You see how many kids, AU teams, kids play on, um, you know, there's just so much movement and constantly searching for the right place. When the place is probably right, it's the opportunity to overcome some obstacles, learn resiliency and all that. Um, so I think that's been the most dramatic shift is um, the ability to overcome obstacles with kids and the ability for parents to allow that opportunity to happen. Gotcha. Um, and based on that too, with, with your success over the years, you've had uh, that film crew come in last year and film behind the scenes and that's getting millions of views um, across the web uh, and worldwide. So you guys are a known brand. You probably have a lot of kids that reach out to you with the minimum GPA met, with the minimum S SAT met. And then you have to choose from all those that reach out to you to build your roster. Uh, once they do check the academic boxes, what's the next step for you? And how do you, how do you build your team? Yeah, we're looking, um, we, we give our guys right of refusal. So if our guys, like our whole thing is chemistry. Like we're, we're every team that we've had here, that was the best team in NMH, right? They, they all had the same thing in common. They were incredible chemistry. They had, you know, they, they, they believed in each other. There was a brotherhood. They, they loved one another. They had each other's back. So we give right of refusal. If um, one of my players knows a kid and they say, no, that's it. I'm out. Uh, I don't push back. Why, why not? You know? Um, so that's first thing is, is I want our guys to know the kids and sign off. Um, I want them to be wanted right by our guys like yeah we we like that kid we know that kid he fits he, he can handle nmh and the kids know most of the time uh they've been right probably 98 percent of the time uh as far as what i'm looking for is i'm looking for humility uh and uh the op you know what we do is really hard uh you know being a, we want kids to be leaders we want them to be academic we want them to be basketball we want it to be in that order we want it to be very high level uh, and you have to have a level of humility about it. Um, if you're filled with ego, it's going to be really, really hard to do it. So uh, my brother was a, was a professor of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And, you know, before the bout, they, they bow. And I, and I asked him, I was like, all right, obviously, it's a sign of respect. But really, what's that all about? 
he's like, you're emptying your cup of your ego and you're allowing, and your opponent is actually your teacher. And if you're paying attention, the person that you're competing against will fill your cup with information about yourself. Your actual opponent is your ego. So in basketball, if I do a pump fake and the defender doesn't respond, a kid who has his ego filled will say, why didn't that guy move? A kid who has his e the cup emptied of his ego will say, my pump fake isn't good enough. And there's a level of humility that happens in order for you to learn. And we're really looking for that. Um, I feel the time, the two biggest killers for athletes are delusion and entitlement. And I'm constantly keeping my eyes out for kids who are truly delusional about their work ethic in relation to their talent and their entitlement as far as I want things rather than I've, just, I've earned it, you know? So if we have a guy who uh, wins, you know, uh, is, is honored with any kind of award, we always say they earned player, you know, Atlantic, you know, Kellen Grady. He's earned Atlantic 10 Player of the Week. We never say he was given the Atlantic 10 Player of the Week. And we're very selective about that and careful about the words we use because um, uh, entitled kids think they deserve things and, and like without putting in the work. And kids who are filled with humility know that they've earned something and they have more to do. Um, and the kids who, you know, so that's really what we're looking for is, you know, kids who are humble, uh, ego, maybe not free, but ego accessible, and kids who are not delusional and not entitled. And those gotcha. are tough things to avoid. Yeah. And I guess you got to do your due diligence, call coaches, call people in the area you might know, other college coaches. So you're, you're doing work, making sure the kids are going to fit the team if your players don't already know that player, right? Totally, 100%. Okay. In your past 20 years, who's been an example of a kid that uh, when he showed up on campus and hit the court, uh, it just blew you away? Because a lot of this, you're watching highlights, you're watching game tape, maybe the kid visits, but you've never seen him in action. Who's the biggest surprise you've ever had? Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, the kid who turned out to be the biggest surprise is it's pretty easy. I mean, Spike Albrecht um, came to NMH, nobody knew about him. Um, no offers, no, no, no roster, even roster offers at division three, division two, he had nothing. And, uh, I just loved the way he saw the floor, uh, in the film that I watched, he controlled the tempo of all the games I watched. And like, you know, it, there were nine other guys on the court, but none of them impacted the tempo of the game because it was his. And when he got to campus, I, you know, I just, um, I just felt that he just needed some time and some visibility in order to be seen enough. Um, but that his year, he, I mean, he, the whole range, he visited Williams college division three, he visited UMass Lowell. He was talking to division two schools in January. He was thinking about not playing basketball anymore and going to Indiana and just being a student. Um, this is while he was averaging seven assists to one turnover. Um, playing great basketball and in the end he ended up going to Michigan um he was cho he chose between Appalachian State and Michigan and as a freshman he was all final four uh and almost MVP of the 2013 national championship game so I think he was the biggest um surprise period um and then he went you know then he went on to Purdue and everything else and he was actually an assistant for us last year um and you know he He's the guy that I, I use the phrase all the time now, uh, which college coach is brave enough to believe their odds, right? Um, if you watched him play 10 times, it was undeniable uh, his ability to control tempo, his ability to, you know, uh, take care of the ball, his search dribble, and who's brave enough to believe their eyes. And Bayline even said, I'm either going to be a hero or I'm going to get fired for this guy. And he ended up being a hero and he was brave enough to believe his eyes. He's like, this kid can do it. Um, so I think he was the biggest surprise uh, from beginning to end. And on that flip side, you don't have to name names on this. I don't want you to, but what about yeah. a kid that came in pretty highly regarded and just didn't make it? Why didn't that kid make it? 
What would have been yeah, his I characteristic? Mean, I, it, it's the entitled piece. It, 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 for me, it always comes back to that. Um, you know, um, a kid who gets, you know, gets outplayed in practice and doesn't understand why the other guy is playing in the game. And, you know, and the expression, I'm a gamer, you know, it's like, that's not how it works. Like you play well on Tuesday in practice, those five guys are going to start, you know, I say I have five favorites and they're the five best guys and I don't care who they are. And if you, we, you know, we started 11 different guys last year. If you outperform on Tuesday, you're going to start on Wednesday. And for kids who are entitled, that becomes a real problem. You know, it's like, well, that's my spot. And it's like, well, no, it was your spot yesterday. Mm-hmm. Today, it's not yours. So for us, um, it always comes down to that, or, you know, the entitled kids. And, and I think the, the, and you and I talked about this and you, and you actually told me to, um, uh, to sell this more. Uh, our kids don't transfer in college. And it's because of that experience of uh, my place on the team has been earned. For if you're number one, you earned it, and and unfortunately, if you're fifteenth, you earned it too. And I think for the kids that um, buy into that, they're prepared for college, and um, they're not going to transfer. And it gets back to the resiliency thing. Um, but we haven't had a kid transfer, an undergrad kid transfer. We've had some grad transfers. Um, we haven't had an undergrad transfer, you know, since two thousand. 14, 13, something like that. And that's six, seven years of no one transferring in college. And while the rest of the world is 1,500 transfers, 1,000 transfers, zero NMH transfers. Yeah. Um, and it's because of that. I think that's a vital stat. And I think other prep schools are starting to pick up on that too and, and, and put those together because it's, it's not just yours. It's a lot of them. It's just the foundation they get during this, that's right. this time away from home. It just prepares them. Uh, last thing for you here, John, what, when you're not playing basketball uh, or coaching it, because you do play in practice. I know when I first visited you <laughs> seven years ago, I was like, who's the guy in the court? Oh, that's Coach, <laughs> Coach Carroll whipping everyone's butt. Uh, okay. I've, never, I've, I've never seen that before. haven't seen it since. So do you still play with your guys? I, I do on occasion. Um, you know, we have, we're, uh, we're coming out of quarantine today, so we're, gonna, we're not going to run a practice. We're going to have open run. I'm going to lace them up tonight and see how we're doing. Okay. Uh, I figured they're rusty. This might be my chance. Uh, I'm not as not as competitive and complete as I once was seven years ago, but uh, so I still play with them. But otherwise, um, I, I really do like to exercise. And uh, you know, I'm a swimmer. Um, I still do that. I found I refound that. Um, you know, I like fitness. I'm, I'm part of a Peloton group of guys. Um, you know, Evan Evan Cummins, who played here in 2012, played at Harvard. He was captain there. Laurent Rivard played here in 2010. He was captain at Harvard too. Um, we're in a Peloton group. It's really competitive. It's great. Uh, you know, there's, there's more and more NMH basketball alums that are getting on it. And this thing's starting to grow a little bit. Um, so we, I do that. And then, you know, I mess around with the stock market a little bit. I, I worked, I worked for Morgan Stanley for a bunch of years and, and uh, I still mess around with that. And I read a ton of books. I've learned that I can read three books at a time, uh, two audio books, and uh, one paper book because there's three different voices when I read it. So the two audio books will have two different voices and then the audio book will be my voice. Um, so I've learned to do that. So I, I read quite a bit, a lot of leadership books. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not as prolific as Zach Boisford over at Army. I mean, that guy reads, you know, three books a day, it seems. But uh, I take a lot of his referrals and, and George Raveling has a good bookshelf and I, and I steal some, some recommendations from him too. Yeah, leave us with one recommendation of the past year. Is there one book that stuck with you? Uh, the book Mastery is Elite. Um, that takes a 10,000 hour thing and, and really um, takes it to a whole different level. Um, so that, that's, you know, that's, that's pretty deep. I'm just trying to pull up the library here real quick and see what I got. Do you read uh, on a Kindle or is it an iPad? Uh, no, I'll read the paper book. And then the other okay. ones will be audio. I, I just finished John Thompson's I Came as a Shadow, and, and that's that's an awesome book. So I would I would recommend that for sure. And then a really quick book is The Art of Influence. Um, I got that from Adam Cohen over at Stanford, and he's a, he's a great book referrer. Um, and that's a really quick book. That, that's a good one to read, too. Gotcha. I just finished The Gatekeepers. Have you ever read that one? Yeah, yeah. No, I haven't. I'll put that on the list. 
Well, it talks about the inside of uh, an admissions office at Wesleyan and the New York Times yeah. re reporter is following from the whole year and it follows a couple kids and uh, really tells you like, aside from grades and being a good basketball player, I know it's like this year school too. You've got to have a couple other things going on too, totally. right? You've got to be an interesting kid. You can't just be one dimensional. And to me, I mean, that's, I knew that before I read the book, but that you can see this, the discussions going on amongst the staff. I'm like, well, this kid, you know, volunteered and created this, or this kid has his own business where he made 20 K and that, that stuff on the outside, I think is what schools like yours are looking for, what colleges are looking for. And that can separate a kid if GPA and SATs are the same. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Essays and interviews go a long way. We tell our guys that are looking at NMH, don't write about basketball in your essay. Yeah. You know, expose us to some other aspect of your life in your essay. It's a great opportunity to really open up who you are as a person. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, John, it was a pleasure uh, having you on today. It's good talking to you again, uh, not in person, but virtually. And, uh, you know, once again, thanks for this because, you know, you, you helped kickstart this. And they gave me some great ideas, and it's uh, it's good having you as a friend out there in the uh, in the basketball sure. world. Yeah, anything I can do for you, let me know. This is great. Appreciate it, Corey. All right, sounds good. Thanks so much, John Carroll, head coach of Northville Mount Hermon, joining us on the Prep Athletics Podcast. Thanks for tuning in.